Yeah, my name's Hamish. Um, I am product manager at coordinates.com. Um, and because it's always satisfying when you build things, um, who has used coordinates.com or the Linz data? Ah, oh, that's good. Cool. Um, so my background is in software development. Um, I actually got into mapping when I used to work for, uh, for Pizza Hut um, a long, long time ago when Google Maps had just sort of launched their uh, online slippy map um, to Herky. Um, and pizza delivery was a thing. And we had all this data around um, uh, pizza delivery overdue complaints. Um, and I thought it would be fun to geocode those and put them on a map and, um, and show people um, where all our overdue orders were. Um, so that was kind of my introduction to, to mapping, was playing with that, um, that geocoding API and popping it on a map from, uh, from there. And um, From there I went to a civil engineering company and the GIS team where they were using uh, Esri products on the desktop, but they were doing a lot of open source work with Mapnik and PHP for uh, building apps, which was cool. Um, and I was doing a lot of um, open source work with Silverstripe as well. Um, which is a, a local company, uh, does a really cool CMS system. Um, and then I had children, I don't have time any free time anymore, so, um, so that's me. So I've been with Coordinates now for seven years and it's been quite a journey. Um, for those who don't know, Coordinates is a, um, a New Zealand founded SaaS product um, for data management. Um, we specialize in geospatial data management. Um, we uh, host and publish um, tens of terabytes of data uh, we have 65,000 ish users. Um, and our number one focus is getting data used. Um, we take data that's in one place and we, um, we get it to people who need it in another place, um, however they want it, um, whoever they are, whatever software they use. Um, our priority is uh, making it easy to move that data around. Um, so we're a SaaS product, right? Which is an interesting sort of uh, segue actually from uh, Tobias's talk um, from building a stack. So, um, so in a way, we're sort of um, a little bit further down the pipeline where we package up a bunch of technologies and then we offer it on a sort of pay-as-you-go kind of basis. Um, but we are built on open source and we want to acknowledge that we stand on the shoulder of those giants. Um, part of our role is to maintain a healthy open source ecosystem um, by supporting events like this and contributing code um, and, uh, and sort of financial backing of uh, projects and helping certain features get uh, pushed in and tested. Um, and our CTO, Rob, Cobb, uh, Rob Coop, is, uh, uh, just got announced as a new um, Osteo um, charter member, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so today I want to talk about reliability. Um, and it's going to be a real high level, just talk about some of the tools we use and what it takes to do what we do. Um, but I want to start with what is reliable anyway. Um, you know, what is it that we actually mean when we talk about reliability? And I don't want to talk about, you know, sort of numbers. Um, <coughs> But what does it actually mean at a higher level? Um, this is what reliable means to me. Um, I just sold a Toyota, um, a Toyota Corolla. It was uh, one of the most dependable um, cars that I've ever owned. It was great. Um, so Toyota is a company that understands the needs of their customers and has made reliability um, kind of central to their brand, right? So if you're buying a car and you want one that's not going to break down, that you can trust is going to um, go when you need it to go, um, you buy a Toyota. Um, and that's built on lots of reliable components, right? So that's the result of lots and lots of uh, time and effort spent on um, all the little details that go into making that car just work. Um, and that's what a lot of people care about. Some people care about a fast car. Um, some people care about um, a particularly uh, maybe economical car. Um, but if you've got a reliable car, that's what you get. Um, Toyota, my invoice is in the email. Um, <laughs> But what does that mean for data services, right? Getting data from A to B. Um, the most obvious thing is I can get it when I want it, right? The system's going to be going. But it's also about can I find the data in the first place? Um, is it licensed? Um, can I get it in the format that I want? You know, um, if I can go to the um, if I can go to the site and get a KML, but I'm using um, but I'm using uh, something that doesn't consume KML, that's not necessarily useful for me. Um, is it going to be there in five years? Um, you know, does my data move around willy-nilly at the whims of a, of a company that's controlling it, for example? Um, whoops. Um, so we make a lot of product decisions around those factors. For example, we don't federate data. Um, we want you to be able to rely as much as possible on our data, um, which means that we have to have a copy of it. Um, so that's just the start of reliability for us. Um, 
if you can get it when you want it, can I integrate my process around it? So can I go and take a boring business process that I have internally, um, maybe it's every week I go and I download a CSV and I push it into a system and some processing happens. Um, is my system reliable enough that I can go and uh, avoid the busy work with code? Um, good programmers are lazy programmers because we don't like doing that busy work, so we write code that does it for us. Um, can we enable you to be a lazy programmer? Um, a reliable system enables that. Um, but beyond that, can I build my application on it? Can I go and build something brand new on top of the system? Um, I can only do that if I can trust the underlying tools. And then last of all, and this is kind of like the end game, is can I grow a business on top of it? You know you're a platform when your platform enab enables other people to make money, for example. And you can look at companies like Microsoft, which will build a whole bunch of tools that other people can then go and extend and wrap around and make other services. Um, this is pretty familiar in the OS world, right, where um, a lot of the stuff that we build goes on is, is, is the building blocks for the other things we want to make. Um, our focus is in data and data workflows and data pipelines, so how can we make our systems um, reliable enough that other people can go build businesses around data that they hold? And that's what we're quite interested in at the moment. Um, I'll come back to it later, but at the moment I feel like we're in between those last two. So um, people can build applications around it, um, but we think there are things that need to change to build businesses on top of, um, on top of the data. Um, and what's the environment we're operating in? Um, so we push out a lot of data, right? Um, and it's lots of different types of data. It's really hard to tune data when it could be incredibly dense or very sparse. It could be uh, a couple of points. It could be a million polygons that get updated every week. Um, so we've got this incredible range of data. Um, we also have really lumpy uh, like customers, uh, sorry, end users. Um, users are tr strange and unpredictable. Um, I did a talk last year about you know, looking at some of the patterns of when people come and actually do things and you get rushes of data at certain times a day and then it'll be like completely silent for an hour. And um, If you want to provide the range of services and reliability you provide, it's not just what is your average uptime, it's what's your uptime when you've got 100 people in a, um, in a lecture theatre, for example, um, who are you know, going through a tutorial and they suddenly all hit your site and they want to download the same data at the same time. Um, it doesn't work if everything falls over. That's not reliable for that class. Um, and for some of the capabilities we provide, we don't want to put arbitrary restrictions around the data just to avoid hitting some of those caps. Um, so we have more or less unbounded WFS support. Um, it's reasonably easy to stand up GeoServer, um, but if you then make it available uh, with thousands of layers to people who want to um, extract a billion points at a time, um, that becomes a lot harder. Um, so only for exports, um, you know, we don't have a limit on the number of exports any particular user can do. We, we don't want to add any. Um, so how do we design our systems to handle that kind of, uh, that kind of um, environment? And cost. The stuff's expensive. So it is a balancing act between uh, the reliability we can provide um, and the costs involved. Uh, right, so some of the tools we do this with. Um, starting at the bottom, so at an infrastructure level, um, there are kind of two ways we need to store data. One is in uh, files on disk, like raster data, and other, uh, the other type of data is in databases. <clears throat> we love ClusterFS. It's a really cool network file, attached, uh, file system. Um, you set up a bunch of bricks, it auto-balances everything, um, and it means we can pump in a lot of data, and then we can read it out again, so we'll have read copies that we can pull out, and that's really great if you've got a whole bunch of um, uh, data sitting on disk that you need to just uh, get into a, uh, a system of some kind um, and then not worry too much about um, uh, what, what's going under the hood. It's sort of like a raid for the cloud. Um, and of course Postgres, we all love Postgres, it's great, it's amazing. Um, uh, we're, we, um, we have to run um, uh, one um, big write copy and then a bunch of read replicas. So the idea is you have um, one database you're pushing data into and then um, instead of trying to come instead of trying to um, conflict your reads and your writes, um, you have uh, read databases that um, take the write-ahead logs from the, uh, from the master. And, um, and it means that um, if you've got one particular service that is hammering your database, you can split that off into a new replica, for example. Um, 
And there's some cool new features coming as well, which um, fix some of the issues around sharding, for example, around foreign keys, which is um, pretty exciting too. Um, orchestration, this is one of the big changes for us in the last few years. Um, so how do you actually deploy your infrastructure um, into a system and then manage what's deployed? Um, so who's used Docker? Anyone using Docker here? Docker's cool because you can create, instead of having a um, maybe a virtual, a virtual machine environment where you've got to sort of install the right packages and then hope that the code running this part of your stack uh, works with the packages you've installed and then um, it doesn't like break the stuff that's happening in this part of the stack. We can dockerize each service um, and then um, that's like a little, um, um, sort of like a mini virtual machine that you can then deploy out um, however many copies you need and you know exactly what's in it. Um, Kubernetes on the other side for deployment and scaling and management. So um, Kubernetes is great because you can treat your infrastructure as code. You can say I need two of the, I need two database servers and they need to be able to connect to this network share um, and they need to have three geo servers over here and it just makes it happen. It's also pretty handy if you're in AWS um, because if you're running something on a spot instance for example um, and the price goes too high and they, uh, they kill it then Kubernetes can notice that and bring it back up. Um, does great things like if, uh, if something, um, if a container dies, it'll, it'll restart the container. Um, and it just sort of happens for you behind, in the background and you don't have to think about it too much. The other really revolutionary thing for, for this has been actually in our developer environments. So one of the best things we've done um, is always maintaining that we can run our entire stack on a developer laptop. Um, and when you're running the number of services um, that we do, that gets challenging. Um, so in the old days with VirtualBox, um, things would tend to break a little bit and it would take a day for, for someone to actually figure out how to make everything work together now. Um, now we can do a one line command and images come down, everything starts up, the right network shares are there, and it just works, it's so good. It's, it saves us uh, uh, hours of time um, a week probably and just um, development time. Um, the components we use, so GeoServer. Um, so GeoServer's um, great, um, it's basically the only way to deploy an urgency compliant um, APIs. Um, the challenge comes when you need to keep GeoServer running when you have uh, tens of thousands of layers um, with um, lumpy demand um, and running in, a, in an environment where, um, where maybe instances go away. The startup time on GeoServer has been a real problem for us. Um, and what we found now that we need to run at least three um, at a time, and possibly more, um, because we know if one of them gets killed, we need the time, um, we need to keep things running um, while the new ones start up and, um, and load up. So um, and we've also learned from that as well that um, you've got to be really careful with the customizations you add on top. Um, it can be, um, we've struggled a little bit to keep um, GeoServer up to date because some of the um, authentication stuff we want to put on top of it um, has, um, has sort of kept us um, back on, um, on older versions. And that's one of the lessons about implementing on um, FOSS. The fewer changes you can bake in and make custom, um, the better. Uh, and the more you can sort of uh, uh, contribute back and make into, um, into the uh, source images, the better. Uh, Maptic for tile reading is awesome. Um, it's been super reliable. Um, GDAL and OGR. So this is one of our most important packages because we need to be able to change the formats of data so much and probably where we spend most of our open source sort of time. Um, if you are around tomorrow, um, our developer um, Craig is doing a cool talk about um, how um, he rewrote the entire PyTest framework for, um, for GDAL. And if you want to see how to, um, how to work on an open source project with a 100,000 line commit, um, a pull request rather, then that's a good talk. Um, um, and then we use Django as well, which is great. Um, so what is it that we actually provide as well? You know, what, is it, what, are the, what are the things that contribute to Rollerby on our side? Um, you know, we've got all these great components. How do we stick them together? Um, one of the things is internal tooling. I um, talked about that before. Um, the other thing is, is making it asynchronous. So what we need to do is make sure that um, when one service gets hit, it doesn't pull down another um, part of our service. Uh, for example, on analytics side, we need to provide a lot of analytics data back to customers. Um, but we've had uh, cases where a large, rush in, uh, a large rush in demand in one area um, backs up the queue and analytics collection, um, and that starts to flow back, things start to break. So there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done to break out things into different queues. Um, things like Celery is really good for that. So Celery is an open source Python project for um, task queue management. 
So we use that a lot. So um, anything that doesn't have to happen now can happen in Celery. Um, and um, for larger packages with more complex dependency, we've got our own package framework for, um, for building um, uh, pipelines of work around exports that are um, basically can happen um, completely separate from the interactive side. So that an export over here doesn't slow down WFS over here, doesn't slow down API queries, doesn't slow down the website. Um, monitoring. These tools are awesome. So um, to keep things running, we need to, ooh, okay. Sentry for error reporting, um, Grafana for um, stats and log, uh, stat collection, um, and Kibana for, uh, for log search. So I'll burn through really quickly, but Sentry is awesome because it means every exception gets caught and you can see the stack trace of what's going on. It's really hard sometimes if something fails in production, um, especially in a in sort of Dockerized world, you can't get into it so easily. But here we can see exactly the stack trace, what happened, we can dig into it. Uh, Grafana for identifying, identifying bottlenecks. Um, it's really hard sometimes to figure out what is actually slowing something down. Um, Grafana with uh, Telegraph for stats collection means that here, for example, we can see we're hitting a disk limit on, um, on, on our database. Um, so we can actually figure out what it is that we need to fix rather than sort of flailing around, um, knowing that something's wrong but not knowing where it's wrong. Um, and also for like digging into performance as well. So on tile rendering, we can see, okay, how many tiles we're we doing, how many caches, how often are we hitting a cache, um, you know, what's our error rates in rendering, that kind of stuff. Ooh, okay, testing. Um, we use PyTest a lot. PyTest is awesome um, for our unit testing and integration testing. So it's super important that we go, okay, so when we export this bit of data to a geo package, this is what it should look like. Okay, we've made some code changes, we've, updated, uh, we've upgraded GDAL. Does it still have the same result? Is it still correct? And we've actually sort of over the years found the odd sort of like off by one bugs in, in, um, sorry, in our software because you know, there's been a package change, we've got all sorts of weird data that we've come across over the years, we run the integration test and something changes. And we're like, oh, okay, that's, that's really weird. And then front-end testing, um, we use things like Storybook, uh, Wallaby GS, um, to make sure that our front-end still um, looks correct. Um, keeping things going, chat ops. Um, so we, um, lots of our monitoring stuff goes into our um, company Slack channel. Um, so if there's a build failure, um, an error that we haven't seen before, um, things like pull requests. They, they, they're being raised into our company-wide company, uh, company -wide chat so that we can see in real time what's going on in the system um, without sort of it being stuck in, in, um, in an ops monitoring dashboard that the only ops people look at, for example. Um, if we get that company-wide visibility, we can quickly jump on issues and, um, and get into them. Um, yeah, so things like if a customer does an export and it fails for some reason, it immediately raises a source uh, support ticket. We can jump in there, see it's wrong. Quite often we can fix it, we can resume the thing and let the customer know within a couple of minutes, um, which is pretty neat. The result of that, um, we're doing uh, hundreds of thousands of data exports, uh, lots of terabytes of data. Um, error rates um, are well under 1%, we'd like it to be much lower. Uh, we're uh, doing hundreds of map tiles, lots and lots of WFS requests. Uh, WFS, WFS errors are still too high, we'd like to get that down, um, but it's really difficult given the nature of our data, the nature of our custom, our end users rather, um, and um, some of the sort of operational issues of running it. All right, so all of that means we're, we're building a pretty reliable system that's serving 65,000 um, users, terabytes of data, lots of APIs, all that kind of business. Um, however, we're, not, we're still not really that happy. Um, we feel like in 2019 the, we should be able to do this better. Um, you know, the current commercial world is that people are trying to move people into subscription services, which is ironic because we're sort of a subscription service. Um, you know, for example, Adobe Creative Suite is trying to move your workflows into their, uh, into their cloud. Um, but we want our data to be used, right? Like we exist to make the data, you know, we give you a solution to get your data into a system where someone can find it and get it again. Um, and delivering the data is still a hard problem. Um, it takes resources and constant maintenance, et cetera, let alone a bunch of unsolved problems around uh, data collaboration. Um, so re reproducible science, for example, is a, is a big problem. Um, tracking the provenance of data, uh, figuring out where uh, the you know, particular parts of your data came from. There are very few data sets that we all use day to day that are only from one source. Um, they are, you know, the difference with GIS is, is that you know, we're combining from lots of different sources and the end result, we might attribute to one person, 
uh, or we might attribute to one agency or to multiple agencies, but we still don't know necessarily where each bit came from. Um, so we're working on a open source um, solution to these problems. Um, if you'd like to come and talk to us about it, we're looking for uh, developers and data users who are interested in trying it. Um, uh, we're just up in the uh, foyer up there. Um, because we think that the current way of doing things is um, soon to be obsolete and we'd like to fundamentally change how we push data around um, and uh, without sort of um, tying anyone into a particular sort of vendor solution. So, yep, come and say hi. Um, thank you very much. My name's Hamish. Um, yeah, thank you. I've got one which is that obviously this is a technical talk, um, which is great. I'm wondering from a user point of view, what kind of things are you trying to do from a, like a user perspective to make them use data in a more, in a way that helps your technical side? Um, that's tricky because people have, we can't second guess people's use. And that's one of the reasons that we exist is because there's a lot of stuff out there that second guesses what the user wants to do. Um, you know, that's why you see a lot of web maps and portals and, you know, hey, I want, you know, um, we think that you're going to do this, so we built a map that lets you do it. But we're all about the raw data. Um, uh, and so, in a way, we kind of have to suck it up. You know, if you want your, you know, your data like this in this format, um, then we're like, well, okay, well, we work to make that happen rather than the other way around. Making it easy to find, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, so part of this new uh, work that we're doing on um, it, it does um, solve some of those issues that we have with maintaining a complex stack, and so it's sort of a mutually beneficial thing, hopefully. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in your sort of variable providence of your data. Yes. Uh, because um, one of the things that um, I've been running up against is a sort of a big blank about how such data sets that might be official and mm. very well regulated, a la Toyota, which I love, um, but also interface with things like increasing use of local data by, say, um, citizen science data, okay? Mm. Because it seems to me in the open source tradition that as literacy rises, it's, you know, it's never going to affect people at your level, but, but as people know more, I think... Um, people are wanting to test their data against more regulated data? Yeah. Test their reality? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what was the question, I guess? Well, um, the, the yeah. Less, um, less, sort of less professional data collection. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, especially around things like, um, so the, people talk about like, you know, big data. Um, and stuff streaming data, streaming data from things. Often that's really low quality data, you know. Like there's a lot of junk data out there, and there are things that you might be able to tease out of it. And you know, a lot of the work around you know machine learning is you know trying to extract some sort of meaning out of it. Um, on the other hand, there are a whole bunch of people who have collected good quality data themselves, um, and would love to get hold of that. And um, one thing that we are looking to do is um, early next year bring back. Um, free personal publishing of data. Um, so that if you have collected, um, oh, a classic one was, um, I was looking at the, uh, there's a national tree, notable tree register that I discovered the other day. And it was great, like this is just a bunch of, bunch of people. Yeah, who, who, and like, but at the moment it's very hard to extract the data. You can look at it and, uh, and but would love to get that kind of data out. Um, unofficial, but good quality, authoritative data just not because it comes from an agency, but because it comes from people who care. Yeah. Because the other big area of that is the data that's publicly freely registered. Mm. Yeah. So what we would like to do with um, some of the some of the new work is um, is being able to trace those relationships back. Um, and it's funny because in, in the coding world, we've had the tools that do this for a long time. You know, I can you know trace back the changes to a particular line of code to the person who did it. Um, I can't do that to data, so that's one of the things we want to solve. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Hmm.
sorry, I know there are more questions, um, but maybe you can ask Hamish, um, sorry, uh, uh, maybe after this session during lunch. And yeah. I know there are um, <laughs> in terms of questions too. But thank you very much, Hamish. Oh, thank you. Um, and thank you all for speaking.